Yeah, happy Africa Day, everyone. And thank you, Aji, for the introduction. Um, so we're very happy today to welcome on the occasion of Africa Day with Taik, Professor Rashid Ziazemi, one of the most prominent and uh, world-renowned African figures in science and technology. Uh, Professor Yazemi was born and raised in Fez in Morocco and is uh, most well known for the discovery of the graphite anode, which led to the development of rechargeable lithium ion batteries. And Professor Yazemi is widely credited as the, as the inventor who made it possible for all of us to recharge our phones, our laptops, and even nowadays um, electrical cars. Uh, so I'm personally very, very honored to uh, interview you, Professor Yazemi. I'm originally from uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, but my father's family is from Fez. Uh, so, marhaba bik, nahar kibira da. Thank you. Uh, I said welcome uh, uh, to Professor Yazemi, and thank you for being with us today. Um, so, the goal of this interview today. Uh, is to inspire young Africans to go into science, technology, into STEM in general, and get inspired by successful African scientists such as yourself. Um, so I'd like you to talk uh, to us about uh, your upbringing in Fez and your family, and what inspired you to pursue science? Well, uh, to start with, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and. Uh, to remind me that I'm African because that's important. <laughs> of course, I I, I know uh, from the beginning when I went to elementary school that Morocco is the, located in the northwest of Africa, so we're Africans. However, uh, we mostly all the kids of my generation looked to the north, to Spain, France, and uh, England, and so on. So uh, the, the south part, we didn't know much, to be honest with you. I mean, we know the, the continent, but we don't know the people very much, except maybe, the, as you know, Morocco has the um, uh, borders with uh, Mauritania and also uh, somehow a little bit uh, to the south to Senegal. So we have many, uh, especially in the, the, the city of Fez, uh, and I don't know if people know this, that the city of Fez is the spiritual capital of Morocco. It has over 1200 years, uh, you know, uh, age. I mean, it's uh, one of the oldest capitals in Morocco. And uh, it has the largest Medina in the world. The Medina means uh, streets where the cars cannot go inside. Okay, that's uh, so the largest Medina. It's a uh, kind of a labyrinth of streets and so on. And uh, when I was a kid, I uh, actually... Uh, uh, play the game to be lost in the Medina and find my way. So that's <laughs> to have the sense of orientation. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my family, uh, it's like average uh, Moroccan family. Uh, my father uh, uh, ran, uh, at, that, at his time, uh, ran a, a business uh, relating to uh, milk products. And uh, my mother, of course, took care of the, the house. And uh, also she had the school of uh, Moroccan broderie, which means that uh, uh, in the morning, there are uh, maybe eight to 10 uh, young girls who, for some reasons, uh, were not uh, allowed to go to school. But instead, their parents want them to learn something to do. Okay? So my mother was like the teacher. Uh, to teach them how to do the the the, the broadery, uh, which is called the the broadery of Fez, which is typical because uh, uh, yeah, the same uh, uh, pattern you can see it's uh, both sides of the so that's very 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 interesting, and it has something mathematical. So anyway, I mean it's interesting when I uh, so you are asking me when it started. I uh, I always developed a sense of observation and uh, asking questions to myself or asking questions to people. And uh, this curiosity uh, sometimes uh, is positive, but sometimes it was very negative. So <laughs> most of uh, my teachers and uh, maybe other people, they, they complain that I was kind of kid that uh, spontaneously would ask a question, maybe without raising the hand and so on. So I was a little bit, I mean, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I, I worked very hard to to be among the first, uh, you know, uh, five uh, of the class, you know, <laughs> ranking among the first one. 
But at the same time, uh, I like to play. I like to make jokes. I like to uh, have people uh, joking and uh, making stories and so on. And uh, the other thing very important is that uh, my father was uh, a member of the first uh, football team of my city, which is called the Maghreb uh, uh, Arab Sportif, so the MAS, MAS, Al Maghrib Al Fasi in, in Arabic. So in uh, 1948, uh, the, 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 the team was formed. And believe it or not, three of my Yazami, I mean, my two uncles and my father were part of that team. So we, I grew in a, like a very sport-oriented family. So uh, in, the, in the houses in Fez, there is uh, what we call the center of the house. Was the dar, was the dar, was the dar, and this was dar. We converted to uh, a football, uh, you know, field. <laughs> you know, with me or a kid, you have enough space, so we played like crazy all the time. That's very important because when you combine curiosity, which leads you to science, and also sports, you learn many values, like uh, respect the rules, respect your the other person you are playing with, and so on. Uh, try not to te- not not to cheat or something. That's all these uh, values that sports uh, uh, teach us. Uh, my father, because he was a, a part of the first uh, uh, football team of uh, the city of Fez, when he uh, retired from the football, the, the, uh, the, uh, the team, I mean, the, the organization, they give him a lifelong access to the uh, stadium, uh, the stadium uh, Hassan II in Fez. So he could go there for free for the rest of his life, okay? But uh, I, of course, I, lo- I love to go with him and watch the, uh, the, uh, the games, you know, uh, and this was an incredible in- ambience, you know, you have all the musicians and people uh, cheering, chanting, and so the ambience is just absolutely incredible. So all of this, I mean, I grow in this medium where actually I went to school, I played a lot of football, I also uh, uh, started to be interested in, uh, in geology uh, in, uh, when I was like 11 years old. So when I went out of the city uh, uh, beyond the, the walls of the, 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 the old city of Fez, you go to the little bit of the countryside and uh, you can find a lot of rocks in, on the road, on the street. So you just, I took these ro- this, uh, uh, rocks and I break them. And I look the composition. So I had a collection of uh, at least 50 different types of rocks. And each rock had the name and the composition and everything. So I started my, I would say, my passion for science as a, maybe a, a geologist, you know, an amateur geologist. And uh, uh, actually, I had a small lab in the, in the house in the sense that I could uh, see whether a rock uh, reacts to acid. So there, there's some uh, calcare, what we call uh, uh, like a chalk or something like that. And also the hardness of these rocks uh, against the, 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 uh, the glass. So we, we take a, a glass and you see if uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, if the, the rock is harder than glass or less hard and so on. So anyway, and I also have a magnifier, you know, something that I can see the details of the rock. I didn't have a microscope, unfortunately, I couldn't afford it. Anyway, this is how I started my yeah. interest in science. And, uh, you know, I was in an ambience where uh, family uh, with the great values because uh, our father wanted us to be successful. So after the classes, I had to go to his shop, you know, the milk shop. And during the, the time I spent with him, he was giving me dic- dictations, uh, calculus, and uh, a lot of things that I have to do, homework. <laughs> he was serving his client, and the, he was serving his client at the same time asking me questions like a like a mental calculation. Uh, you take four, you multiply by three, and you add twelve or something like that. How much is the total? You know this kind of thing. <laughs> so that that's wonderful. So uh, I mean, outside the the house, I have my father, of course, my other friends, and so on. Inside the house, my mother uh, was taking care of the family. I am one out of seven children. So this is average, you know, family in, the, in that uh, generation of my, uh, my mm-hmm. parents. Uh, actually, uh, most of my, our neighbors in the same uh, small uh, street, which we call Derb, 
in, in Fez, uh, the, most of the families have like uh, six to eight uh, kids, you know, in each family at that time. So anyway, the, the, this is a great ambience actually to, it's all, all this, uh, I would say, environment is very structuring to, to me. And uh, at the end, you know, I started to uh, be more interested in uh, modern in science, uh, science yeah, yeah. and so on. So maybe you have other questions that would we'll be happy to answer. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's really interesting like just like your curiosity and just like how your environment like influenced how you wanted to pursue science so uh, that's i think like so you you mentioned that uh, you uh, after your upbringing in fez you went to rabat then to pursue studies you then went to rouen in france and then after that you pursued your studies in grenoble that's in uh, eastern france and towards the the end of your studies at an engineering school, you said you wanted to become a scientific researcher. So Correct. what inspired someone to go into research, whereas you you can like go ahead and just like, for example, get a job as like an engineer? Well, there is a story behind this. And uh, yeah. when I was in the uh, <clears throat> secondary school, I was like 11 years old. Uh, we had uh, that's uh, what we call the lycée or college in in uh, in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, we had uh, uh, science classes uh, in French. Okay, so mm -hmm. we have uh, natural sciences and also physics and chemistry plus mathematics. Okay, and uh, I was actually pass passionate by, uh, with chemistry. The teacher, we, who was a French teacher, was so much passionate the way how uh, he taught us chemistry was just incredible. So most of the kids in the class, they loved you know, science and they loved the chemistry and, uh, and, uh, and the physics. Mm -hmm. One day, one day I missed the bus that takes me every day from home to the lycée. I missed it by maybe 10 seconds. And I was desperate, oh my gosh, I will be uh, you know, late to the school. I cannot, anyway, it's a, mm. something they don't want to do. And surprisingly, a car stopped and I had a gentleman telling me, hey, come in, come in. And that <laughs> gentleman was my teacher in, in physics and chemistry. And uh, so he drove me back to the school and uh, in, on the way, uh, in the middle, he was talking, talking, talking all the time. And I was just listening and really like uh, shaking because I was very impressed and very shy. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, uh, in the middle of the road, he pointed his finger to me. He said, I will say it in French, and everybody may understand what I will uh, translate it in English. Toi, Rashid, tu seras chimiste. You, Rashid, you will be a chemist. Okay. And uh, 10 years later, I was actually uh, in the Grenoble Institute of Technology to select which department I will be going to, to do to, be, to become an engineer. And at that time, uh, computer science or so computer engineering was the top, you know, mm. school. So the gentleman said, oh, you are ranking very well. You can go to that school, uh, to all the, the best school in, in, in our, you know, uh, institutes of technology. And I said, you know what? I would like to go to chemistry because I, <laughs> I remember this finger pointing to me and said, you will be a chemist. So the, this gentleman who was like, uh, you know, said, oh, you are crazy. You know, uh, uh, chemistry is ranked number five or in, in, in all the schools. If you go to applied mathematics or applied, uh, you know, computer science, you will get 50% mm -hmm. higher, higher, you know, uh, wages, higher salary. Why don't you go to chemistry? I said, please don't ask questions. I just want to go to chemistry. It's okay. I give you chemistry. And then uh, after I graduated as a... a an engineer, you know, a master in engineering, I had two options. One is to start working in a company like most of the engineers. And the other is to pursue as, a, for, to continue for a PhD for program, project. Mm -hmm. And I took another important decision is to say, yes, I would like to, to get a PhD and continue to do research, you know, because I see myself as a, mostly as a researcher. And uh, we had a professor with the, uh, the school of electrochemistry in Grenoble. He was actually, his role was to uh, give advice 
to uh, you know uh, uh, graduate graduated students or they, they connect them with companies they can help them find a job and so on and when i i i filled the the the, the one one form and the, the the question was what do you want to do i said research 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 three times and he came to oh, me no. very angry why why do you select research when you are engineer you shouldn't have uh, come to an engineer school you, you go to a science you know a faculty of science something like that <laughs> so anyway i told him look what when you have a, a diploma, like a degree of engineering, uh, anytime you can go and find a job in a company, it's not a problem, okay? So I, 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 I would keep my degree to open me the opportunity to, to find a job, but my passion is science and research. I said, okay, so this, this is the second important decision where I entered in uh, 1978. I started my... Uh, uh, PhD program uh, in the same Institute of Technology of Grenoble. And this is when I started to work on lithium batteries. That's the beginning of the story. Yeah. So that's like uh, a whole other story. So, um, was it in 1980 that you made uh, the yes. uh, uh, graphite uh, uh, anode discovery? Uh, so it's a very important discovery um, that you made around that time. You graduated from your PhD in 1985, and then you joined the CNRS. So that's France's National Center for Scientific Research, for those who, who don't know. And of course, it's a very, very competitive process to, to get there. Um, I think you the, there is like a, a, an entrance exam, of course, for that. Um, uh, and it is the largest uh, fundamental science agency in Europe. So it's quite an achievement. Um, and then you climb up like the ladder of uh, until you become like a research director at the CNRS. Um, so what I would like to talk about to next is that, so you discover basically the negative pole of uh, lithium ion batteries. And then um, you, uh, there is an American scientist uh, based in Oxford, who invents the positive pole around the same time. You're not, you're doing your discoveries completely separately. Um, the American scientist gets a patent for his discovery, and then you are uh, discouraged from getting one. Um, so that there, there is that point that I'd like to talk about. But also, most importantly, uh, those two discoveries together will lead to the uh, building of rechargeable lithium ion batteries in Japan out of, uh, you know, uh, in a different uh, country. You're uh, the American scientists yourself, as well as uh, the Japanese inventors will get uh, recognized for this discovery in 2014 with the Dr prestigious Draper Prize uh, given by the US National uh, Academy of Engineering. Um, however, in 2019, there was a huge controversy when the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to the American and Japanese inventors for uh, the development of lithium ion, uh, lithium ion batteries, but they did, they did not include you in the prize. So that was something that is kind of representative of the obstacles that African scientists and scientists from developing countries in general face in, in STEM, this kind of like lack of recognition. Despite all of this, what is very admirable about you is that you uh, have persevered, uh, went ahead and created in Singapore a microchip that enables very fast charging of batteries. So what I want to ask you is, could you tell us more about like your experience, how it differs your second discovery from the first one? And what kind of message would you give to uh, young Africans nowadays who would face systemic obstacles uh, in STEM? Well, uh... Lots of things huh? you <laughs> mentioned from you know the the early discovery of the uh, uh, positive and negative poles of the lithium battery by uh, John Godinov in Oxford and uh, myself in in Grenoble in France almost the same year uh, the end of 1979 the beginning in 1980 totally independently we discovered this I didn't know him actually I was just young I was like uh, 26 years old. And he was already like a, a very recognized professor in Oxford. He was in the, his 50s, you know, so uh, I didn't have any chance to meet him, uh, you know. Um, and by the way, he, uh, Prof. John Gideonov, uh, his uh, 
uh, major is not batteries. He, he was mostly working on uh, mm. uh, materials for uh, superconductivity and also for uh, magnetism and so on. And uh, uh, some of the materials are said B-dimensional. It's like a layered structure. And uh, he uh, actually uh, started to work on the lithium cobalt oxide, the cathode material, uh, quite late in his career, I mean, uh, uh, in Oxford. And uh, uh, he uh, developed this concept together with a, a, a visiting scientist from Japan, okay? So anyway, just to tell you uh, that that's the, 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 the story. Uh, I, I was happy, actually, very honored to share with him two prizes. One uh, given by the largest uh, professional organization uh, in engineering in the world. It's, ca it's called the IEEE, the mm -hmm. Institute of Electrical and uh, 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 Electronics Engineers. It has half a million members around the world. So it's a mm -hmm. huge uh, uh, organization. And in 2012, three of us, with uh, uh, Dr. Yoshino, uh, Professor uh, Goodenough, and myself, we uh, received the prize for the development of lithium battery. And uh, two years later, it was a little bit higher degree, we had a higher, mm -hmm. I would say, prestigious uh, prize, which is called the Draper Prize. And by the way, the Draper Prize is considered the Nobel Prize for engin in engineering. Yes. And uh, just to make a very short story, uh, when uh, Mr. Alfred Nobel, uh, 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 created his uh, foundation and he gave all his wealth to that foundation. He said, I want the, the foundation to recognize very high spirits, uh, human, uh, human spirits who contributed to the progress of humanity in only five areas. Okay, chemistry, physics, biology and medicine, uh, peace and uh, literature, something like that, okay? So that, that's the five. But he didn't include engineering. Mm -hmm. Engineering was not there. So the National Academy of Engineering in Washington, D.C., they went to meet the, National, the Royal Academy in Stockholm, in Sweden. And they mm -hmm. said, well, we would like to sponsor a Nobel Prize for engineers. And uh, very politely, the Swedish said, sorry, we cannot do that because uh, the testimony of Mr. Alfred uh, Nobel doesn't include this, we cannot change it. So, okay. So they come back to Washington DC and they created their own Nobel Prize of Engineering. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to me, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. The Nobel, the, the, uh, the Draper Prize to me has much higher value than Nobel Prize. The reason yeah. why it is given to those who made an incredible uh, progress in engineering for the humanity. And it should be something practical. I mean, uh, in, in order to get the, the Draper Prize, if you are an engineer, your invention, your uh, discovery or invention should have been touched or used by at least 1 billion people on earth. Okay? Wow, yeah. This is the rule. There is the rule. So if you look at, you know, the, like uh, the, uh, the GPS or other <laughs> inventions, they are all used all over the world. And this, the, the, this invention were recognized by the Draper Prize. And Nobel Prize is much uh, more prestigious. Everybody look at the Nobel Prize. Of course, it's much prestigious. However, it can be given to people who came with a, just a concept, an idea. It doesn't need to be useful. It, I mean, it's, it should be useful, but it doesn't need to be applied, the, the, this mm -hmm. idea. But this idea opens horizons for the next discoveries, okay? So the thing is that when you look at the lithium ion battery, uh, the, rec the international recognitions, uh, the number one, the Nobel Prize cannot be given to more than three people. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. And this is also part of the uh, Alfred Nobel testimony. We cannot change it, okay? Uh, the Draper Prize can be given to one, two, three, four, even sometimes more. People. So they don't care about the number. Uh, so that's that's very important. Now uh, I think the uh, this is my personal opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but anyway, you I will never know exactly why uh, I wasn't awarded the the Nobel Prize in 2019, where my two other 
you know, recipients of the IEEE and the DREPE prize, they got it, is uh, because there was one gentleman who I know very well, a professor. Uh, he's a, a British, but uh, he, uh, 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 I mean, he's a, a, you know, uh, his university is in the New York State, okay, uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Stanley Wittingham, okay? I know him very well. Of course, we know uh, all each other. He's very smart, very bright scientist, no doubt about it. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Wittingham came with a concept in mm -hmm. 1975, much earlier than I and uh, uh, John Godinov, saying that if we want to produce a rechargeable lithium battery, we have to use uh, intercalation materials. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple sentence, and he gave an example to show his concept. But that example, which is a, a, a cathode material based on titanium disulfide, has never been commercialized. It has no practical application at all. Absolutely no application. Okay, so mm -hmm. the this is the reason why uh, Prof. Uh, Good uh, Stanley Wittingham didn't get the Draper Prize. Okay. Because mm -hmm. his invention was not Commercial practical, life. he didn't, uh, no. but he got the Nobel Prize because of the concept. He came with the concept, okay, yeah. of uh, intercalation materials. But anyway, this is, this is just to give you the, the difference between the two. Personally, I am a, a scientist, of course. I am an engineer. I am an inventor. So the best price I could get is the Draper Prize, definitely. <laughs> okay, so yeah. that's why, I mean, I feel very happy and not absolutely uh, disappointed or something. At the beginning, yes, I was disappointed, but uh, it's, it's, it's okay. I think uh, maybe I would be recognized for uh, other, you know, development that we are doing now, like the, the ultra fast charging of batteries. Yes. We solved one of the, one of the oldest problem uh, since the 19th century when the uh, uh, lead acid batteries was, were developed you know, uh, in the, the, the middle of the 19th century. Until now, until 2022, the way how we are charging batteries is really not smart enough. So we just apply a constant current to charge the battery. And then we uh, sometimes we apply a voltage or something like that. So it's uh, mostly very, I would say lazy, not smart, not very, uh, I would say sophisticated method. And the battery is very sophisticated system. I can tell you. So if you apply a non-sophisticated method to charge a sophisticated system, it doesn't work very well, especially if you want to charge your battery in uh, less than one hour, okay? Which uh, today, Tesla, who lead the, the, you know, the uh, electric vehicle you know, industry uh, in the United States, Tesla mm -hmm. is unable to charge, uh, the Tesla are unable to charge their battery in less than one hour. It's impossible. They cannot charge from zero to 100%. In, uh, in less than one hour. So we solve this problem. We uh, totally rethink the way how we should charge a battery, okay? Mm -hmm. And we came with a, a, a method called the non-linear voltammetry. This is maybe too, too technical, but this is what I invented. I, I invented the non-linear voltammetry that uh, makes it possible to charge a battery, some batteries to six minutes Wow. In six mm -hmm. minutes, I can fully charge a battery. And we demonstrated, and I showed it to international meetings all over in, in Europe, in the United States, in Japan. Every time I have the opportunity to show this data, I show them. So uh, uh, this invention- this, uh, this discovery is patented. Of course. The, the, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 graphite anode, the graphite anode actually uh, people, uh, uh, you know, they in, in the 19, in 1980, they, they thought the graphite anode will not go very far. You know, they said, oh, it's a mm -hmm. nice idea from academic people, but uh, uh, we doubt, I mean, the, this is an industry in France. They said there is no future of this, uh, uh, this uh, discovery. And now it is uh, more than 
100 billion dollar <laughs> business. Yeah. So there is <laughs> I, 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 yeah, unfortunately, I'm not getting any royalties from this <laughs> because we didn't. Yeah, so just so you know, to clarify yeah. to everyone, it's a, a you know the the rechargeable batteries are uh, or the commercialization of them is worth around 80 billion US dollars. Uh, so uh, I think I've I've heard like higher numbers. Yeah, so but it's it's really yeah. Uh, so I, I want to just get to our last question, and uh, so that like you can, I can uh, finish this interview very well. We, you, we've heard like awesome, your awesome testimony shows that like you know, uh, uh, people uh, from our continent need to persevere. You believed in yourself, and that's why you uh, went ahead Absolutely. and like had a fruitful career. Um, so you were recognized by a. Uh, Moroccan Royal Medal given to you by the Moroccan King in 2014. So that was your second prize for the year, um, yes. uh, along with the paper prize. Uh, and um, you were, so you, you went kind of like everywhere. You were in France for your studies, uh, where you were research director at the, 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 the French National Research Center. And then uh, you were in Singapore where you were chair professor a very high distinction in uh, at the uh, Singapore's Nanyang Technological University, uh, where in Singapore you were welcoming Moroccan PhD students, where you were receiving visiting scientists from Moroccan universities, and you also spent uh, 10 years in California. You initially wanted to spend just one year, and uh, okay. uh, you were at Caltech, very high distinction as well. They know, as you say, Caltech is a very small community, but very uh, highly prestigious and recognized. Lots of prizes came out of Caltech. Um, and then in 2019, you decide to uh, strengthen your ties with Morocco and you take a part-time position at the university in your hometown of Fez. So, Correct. you know, talking about this brain drain, I just want you to uh, give you like if you can give us like some final message about why you decided to do that and how important it is for you after going everywhere around the world to still uh, maintain a very strong ties with your own country all right so there's like a common denominator to all of this every country in the world any civilization any culture people they prize the scientists and inventors everywhere i go you, I am welcome. That's very good. And uh, I mean, the, the um, message is that yeah, um, you know, uh, there's a very positive actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, welcome everywhere. Uh, in addition to the countries you mentioned, France, uh, United States, and Singapore, I also spent two years in Japan. And during these two years in Kyoto University, I went to uh, uh, Japanese language school and I learned a little bit of Japanese which helps me actually uh, maintain, you know, a good relationship with my Japanese friends. Before the COVID, I used to go every year to Japan because they have the uh, National uh, uh, Battery Symposium uh, every year. So, but uh, I think in this year, it will not be, it's still uh, like a virtual, but in 2023, I hope I will come back there. Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, if I have to pass a message uh, to uh, young uh, uh, African uh, people say, number one, uh, trust in yourself and uh, uh, think about, you know, having like a, a roadmap or something, thinking about your dream, you know. Uh, uh, I, I always dreamed to be what I am today, to be honest with you. At age 10, I said I would like to be a scientist. I would like to be a researcher. Uh, and uh, I don't care about the money. I don't care much. So... There is this cartoon called the Tintin, Tintin, you probably you know it. And uh, one figure in this uh, cartoon uh, is a Professor Tournesol. I don't know, before yeah. your generation, they may not know exactly, but uh, in my generation, uh, Tintin and the, uh, Professor Tournesol were like, uh, 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 how to say, uh, celebrities for me. And uh, that professor was a crazy man. He was always having a pandula. And uh, he was uh, like uh, always in the moon, in the sky, in the, in the clouds and so on. So he's very far from reality, but he has very bright ideas sometimes, okay? <laughs> so he was my model. That figure, I mean, that personage was somehow my, my model. I said, okay, I don't want to like comb my hair every day. It doesn't matter. What I want is just uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, spend my time doing research, inventing things and so on. So that's from the beginning is a kind of dream, you know, and uh, if you keep this dream for uh, the, the rest of your life, it will guide you. It's like a, 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 a star in the sky. You see this, this star and you follow it. And I, I was a little bit like a stubborn. I mean, in my idea, I always wanted to go there and I didn't always be successful. Of course, it's always uh, difficult to, to, to continue. But even when I fell, when I, 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 fall, I fall, I, I, I continue, I stand up again and continue my, my journey until now. So uh, it's, a, uh, I think uh, uh, the message here is trust in yourself, trust in your dreams, and do all what you can do, you know, to, to achieve your dreams. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Rashid. That's, that's a wonderful way of finishing like the, this interview. Uh, that uh, I'm sure that the message reached all of our audience. Uh, thank you so much again. Shukran uh, Bzef. And thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'll let like, um, I think uh, Aji uh, will uh, announce the, the rest of the program. So just a question, should I stay for the panel or can, because it's like uh, now almost 10 p.m. And uh, I have a routine that I never sleep after uh, 9.30 every day because I wake up very early in the morning. So can I just leave? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank okay. you for, for uh, spending you. time with us. Thank you. Okay, thank Next. you. Thank you, have a good day.